Um, so we'll get right to it. We want to welcome Mika Mabragana, Annie Morris, and Brittany Stanley, who've all been part of Dressage for Kids to one degree or another over the years. And uh, as you all know, are now each of them living in, in uh, Europe and uh, some of them perhaps longer than they planned, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but I'm gonna ask each of them to start out just telling us uh, what you're doing now um, and what this COVID-19 has done to change your plans, if it has. So shall we start with Mika? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, well, I originally Oh, and came... by the way, before, sorry, I'm interrupting, uh, just to keep your language clean, we are recording this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. okay. So, Mika, what's going on okay. in your life? Okay, so I came to Spain in January, and I was planning on being here three months. I came here with a client's horse to compete and train and in the middle of those months i decided maybe i should stay a little longer to take advantage that i was already here and then the whole COVID thing came out and i was like well i'm just gonna stay <laughs> indefinitely for now i said one year but i don't know right now how long you'll be and what are, what are you doing you're training teaching I'm not teaching, I'm training. Um, I'm training um, with Antonio Diaz Porras and I ride his horses and his clients' horses. So I'm basically like um, an, a very high scale working student <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have to do any of the dirty job. So. Well, we, we chatted a little earlier. Tell me what your, your normal day is like. Well, the, the day here starts at 8 a.m., which to me is already so late. <laughs> I'm like, oh, horses eat at 7, by the way. <laughs> um, and we usually work until 3 o'clock. And from 3 to 5, we take siesta time. Uh, which everybody goes to have lunch and then we nap for like an hour and then from five usually till 8 30 or 9 we work again so it's a definitely a different schedule and when I first came I was like why don't we just carry on and finish at like six you know it could be done but then it's nice to sit down and actually have lunch, an actual meal, not a sandwich on the go, or no lunch at all. And then the siesta time, you just need the siesta because if you eat a meal, you need to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Annie, how about you? So, oh, sorry, Mika. Anything else? No, that it, it was just um, a little bit of a change, but I adjusted pretty quickly to that. Good. <laughs> Annie, what are you doing nowadays? So I moved to Portugal like three years ago. And since then I've had three jobs. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and actually I just came to a new job in February 1st and it was a bit of a, of a surprise. I had mostly left because I was not uh, very functioning at the previous job. But the, and this place was like, ah, oh, you know how to teach lessons? I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> among <laughs> other things. But I, I started there and it turns out to be a really amazing job. They have horses that compete internationally for juniors and young riders and ponies. And I've been working with the horses and coaching the, the girls and everyone there is so nice and lovely. So anyway, I barely knew this when the COVID crisis started. And the main change was that uh, we weren't allowed to give lessons anymore. We had a special meeting with the, the town to make sure the owners of horses could come and still be able to ride, but we weren't allowed to teach or get close to them and it was only a few allowed at a time. So uh, what ended up happening was I spent something like 10 hours a day riding horses for 
six weeks and it was really incredible like i said some of the horses here are really top quality international horses and uh, the people were actually really happy to have me because i have experience with so many types of horses and actually a lot of people here in portugal mostly have experience with lusitanos which are pretty specific and then the training it should be the same but like you can kind of get away with not understanding it as well uh, maybe or not understanding the same things and still train a Lusitano and not so much with the, the warm bloods like these guys have. So it's been really cool. And this my schedule is even worse than Mika's because we start at nine <laughs> and then we have a two hour lunch <laughs> between <laughs> one and three. And then I still get done at seven. <laughs> and we're 10 minutes away from one of the most beautiful beaches in Portugal, oh, wow. which is a country of beautiful beaches. So it could be worse. <laughs> okay, Brittany. Oh boy, okay. So I've been in Denmark for four years now. The first three I was working for Morton Thompson's. So I was a head rider there, which was fantastic. But I got the idea a year ago that it was time to move on and find something else. So I've done a little bit of exploring. But as of January, I started out for myself. It was kind of good timing because I think of everyone, I've been affected the least with COVID because I was at a private place where it was essentially my clients and horses, but mainly the horses without the clients at that time anyway. So we're some of the few that could still train as normal. I rode, Addie came over right before the borders closed, so now she's stuck helping me for a little longer than she planned. But um, the beginning of May, actually, I partnered with another Grand Prix rider from, actually from Latvia, that does international shows here. So now we have a business together at another farm where we're doing um, high quality young horse sales mainly, also some older horses. And then I can train my students and clients and she can have hers. And then it's more people working together. So we have a little more support. But I'm still just 10 minutes from Morton. So I'm able to take horses and one of my clients goes over and trains with him and have a nice setup for us in between times. So, so far it's working very well. But um, yeah, of course life in Denmark changed, but my business was a little protected because of the particular place that we were at. So we were very fortunate. I'm wondering, and Brittany, we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, why Denmark and why not back home in the US? For now or in the beginning? Like why did I come Both. to Denmark? Yeah. Both, okay, um, but for Morton. So I found out that Morton was hiring a young horse rider and as soon as I found out it was him, then I picked up everything in one month and moved over. Mm -hmm. And then I figured out all of the pieces. I left a dog and horses and a few other things behind that I had to sort out as I went, but it was definitely the best decision. And then well, what? Yeah. what? what why, why have you decided now to start a business in Denmark and not come back home or come back to okay. the US? Yeah. Partially because of a boy. <laughs> always, there's, always, there's always a man, right? Yeah. A Danish boy for now. But even if things didn't work out that way, the industry here, you can find, in my opinion, and I might get in trouble for this, but I still think you can find better quality horses at a lower price here than in the States. And now I've started to work with breeders that are willing to funnel horses to me that I can get very, very high quality young horses to compete on and also for clients back home. So part of my goal is to get my friends and their clients the highest quality horses we can to improve the sport back home. So I have now a very nice four-year-old that I'm hoping to do championships with next year here and then ship her over later that she can also compete in the States and do well. But it's trying to improve the sport on both sides. And it's a, it's a good niche in the industry for me being an American that people can trust here that knows the Danes and the industry and the horses. So it seemed like a logical move for me. Annie, why did you not come home or come back? <laughs> Maybe it's not home anymore. Yeah, I don't know. It seemed like when I decided to move here, it was just, I was actually looking for jobs in the US, but I had already been, well, I'm already kind of old. So I was already kind of old and I was just looking for something really specific and I couldn't find it, you know, and I was picky enough to be like, look, I can't just do anything or just ride for anyone. 
because I know what I like, I know who I like, and I know what I like to do. So I, w um, I hadn't found anything in the US and I found an opportunity here in Portugal. So it's a place that I've only visited once, but it's really incredible because the quality of life is so high. And I think um, for me as a rider, like I love to compete, I love to ride and I love to train. But that's like, if you add up the minutes you're in the show ring per year, it's not enough to like make your entire life, you know? So for me, I was really happy to find a place where I can just have a really nice quality of life and also ride a type of horse I really like. I mean, I've always loved Lusitanos because of having a really good experience with one when I worked with you and um, or a couple. So... I mean, it was kind of a good fit. And then meanwhile, like I said, I've changed jobs a couple of times because of the, the usual reasons of like personalities or like a job kind of reaching a natural end and you need to find something else. But I don't know, I guess I'm still sort of halfway looking into the US sometimes, but it's hard to be, to have a quality of life this high working as a, a dressage trainer where you don't actually make that much money. So, <laughs> Mika, do you have anything? I mean, you've only been over there three months and your life is still in flux. Do you have anything to add in that department? Um, the, in the quality of life? Well, just or in general. I mean, you're, you're still thinking, you're not over there as permanently as the other two, I think. At this right, point. I have, I have, um, I took a year trial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's what I told my barn owner, at least, and everybody else. Um, but I've, I've always wanted to experience Europe, and I actually had a really good business going on and a really, in a really beautiful barn. And in the States. It was in the States. Yeah. And it was very comfortable and very mine. Um, so it was hard to pick up and leave. Um, I mean, all my stuff is basically still there, but um, I think it's it, it's good to sometimes just make a move and be brave and and try to see what's out there. So uh, she sort of Mika sort of answered uh, what my next question was. So Annie. Of course, you you wandered around Europe a little bit before you ended up in Portugal. Is that correct? Yeah, I was in Germany for six months before. And what decisions led you to decide to go to Europe in the first place? What What was on your mind with that? <laughs> well, I mean, Europe has the best training and the best horses in the world. I mean, I I agree with that still with, um, I wanted to go to Germany to ride and I wanted to to see the horses like, like uh, we said, the quality is so nice. And um, yeah, I don't know if I could have done it in the US. I'm a little bit too like wanderlusty to maybe stay there forever. So, but we'll see. <laughs> and Br Brittany, do you have anything to add? I mean, you basically went in order to work with Morton Thompson. Yeah. Uh, you weren't specifically looking to go to Europe at that time? Or or not? Um, I actually didn't think I was ready. I remember sitting before I left with a friend and saying maybe in a year if my current plan at the time didn't go well that I would try to come and ride for a dealer or something just like Annie said to see Germany particularly or maybe Holland but I don't think I'm that brave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> see Germany a bit and see the quality of horses and everything else but I and I don't know I don't know that I would have been ready to go anywhere else. Morton very much takes you under his wing and teaches you from the beginning the way that he wants you to work as a rider. And I don't think many other people are as kind in the way that they do it. Um, so I was very fortunate that it happened to work out the way it did instead of my first thought, which was wait a year and then kind of jump in anywhere. So I was very fortunate that it worked out the way that it did. But I did know if I wanted to do this for my whole life that at some point I would need to come over and see the other side of the industry because it is some things are the same horses eat and poop and everything else everywhere but like Annie and Mika said the schedules are different and the culture is different and the attitude towards horses is very different they're much more 
livestock here instead of just pets. And that changes the way the business is run quite a bit from what we see at home. So all of that was really good to experience, but I don't think it was what I expected when I left. Um, this, is, this is pretty broad, but what would you say is or are the maybe two biggest things you learned about riding when you worked over there? I mean, what, 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 in other words, you were riding here and getting good instruction here and learning and showing and so forth. When you went over there, what, what would be the two major things perhaps that, that you learned that was different in your riding about Me? riding? Yeah, we'll start with you, Brittany. Okay. Um, the biggest thing that Morton changed for me is that you have to think of everything from the horse's point of view and that it has to be like systematic to a fault. I don't think he ever rides a line and doesn't have a purpose why he turns left or right at the end. And for me, I've never seen someone who thinks that hard and that much in detail and that's why he's as successful as he is. But he takes horse psychology and a plan for the work to a completely different level. So I had to almost start over with how I think about training horses. And now I have so many patterns from him that Addie also knows because she was at Morton's for a little bit, but we just do it a certain way, like breathing now. And until you go and see other riders, you don't realize that that's really where it came from, I guess. And that's what the last year being then in Europe, but away from Morton has taught me too, is that it's not all Europeans that do it that way. It's, it's Morton that does it that way. So I don't know if that's two things, but that's like the umbrella that covers everything that I've learned is there has to be a system and a reason for everything that you do to be fair to the horses. Fantastic. Annie, anything? Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the main things uh, I don't know, I was so lucky in the US, you're always working with someone and they're, they really believe in you and they're really trying to make like your experience so good. The thing that was different here was, um, I mean, it's going to sound bad, but it was actually good, <laughs> is that you're just like, you're like, okay, we hired you, do this. And you're just responsible to do this. And if you, and like, I think if I had come here at the wrong time that would have been really scary <laughs> but actually it made me realize like that I can do all this stuff and it's no problem and I can do it really well because I've been like working my entire life to get to this point a bit or someone can be like you know here's a horse here's a problem fix it and um yeah it was the first time that happened rather than someone like step by step helping me do it, which is what I needed for a really long time before now, you know? So that was interesting. And I honestly, I haven't seen a lot of uh, coddling here. So maybe that's <laughs> always how it is and it doesn't always work out so well. Um, but for me, it was really interesting. And then in my riding, I, I finally think I learned how to sit in the canter. So thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're really saying that I mean, and I think from, from what Britt was saying, Brittany was in with Morton Thompson, a very unusual situation, I think. I think what mm -hmm. your experience is, is more common where they, they just, you just do it. Figure yeah. it out. Yeah. The, somebody Think or swim. taking you every step. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mika? Yeah. But I mean, it only worked because of being babied for a long time before. You had, you had the foundation. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Mika? So the question is two things that are... Yeah. Well, what, what have particularly you learned while you're there? Um, well, in the training point of view, I think here um, what I see is that they do teach the horses to do things pretty quickly. I mean, you don't see a 10-year-old horse learning the flying changes you know uh, and that even if they're not super quality or even if they're not super supple they learn the one tempest they learn the piaf passage maybe not to ever compete or show but for the owners then to have a lot of you know tools to play with with the with the horse or to then eventually sell 
Um, so that I see as a big difference that um, the horses learn things at a pretty young age. And then if they are really high quality, it's almost like then they take the time to develop them even further. But if not, it's like a six-year-old or a seven-year-old here is doing a few one tempis, a few steps of piaf, a little bit of passage, of, and everything else, it's um, available. Um, like, they don't say a FI prospect when they are just learning a flying change and they are 12. Um, so, <laughs> so that's uh, one of the big differences that I see. Because I, when I first came, I'm like, I'm just going to make the frame good and the connection good before I even think of doing a flying change. And they're like, come on, just do, do a change, like do something. <laughs> I'm like, oh, but the, the camera is not very good right now. <laughs> so uh, that was a big change. In, in, and and not, they are, not that they are above the beat doing things. I, I don't mean it that way. But it's like they make it, you know, so that they are continuously moving. Now, if you're in Spain. Are you riding warm bloods or Spanish horses? I'm riding um, both warm bloods oh. and PREs and Lusitanos and yeah, everything. I love everything. Um, yeah. We'll start with Annie this time. Um, with hindsight, was you, would you do anything differently than what you've done in your journey? Mm, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean you have I mean it's hard to say cuz I feel like I'm I'm almost like in the right place at the right time for like the things that happen. So I can't even look back and think I would have made another choice. I mean, I feel like I've made some riskier choices. I feel like I've had to be a bit brave and a bit uh do things that were non-traditional, but it always felt right. So I think I always did what was right. Uh-huh. <laughs> How about Brittany? With hindsight, would you do anything differently? That's hard. Of course, you'd like to do things better if you could do it over again, but you never know if you'd end up at the same place. So I still think I would do things the same. Mika? Notes from lessons. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> um... I, I mean, I think like the other girl said, I think whatever we did in the past took us to the place we're now and I, I don't have any regrets, but maybe after I left London's, maybe that was my time to go um, maybe either to Europe or to train under somebody else's wing before I started my business. Because once you start your business, you're you're in it and you're a little bit not stuck but then you know you just keep on going so i think looking back i should have taken time there to further my education in a different way so um to all of you following up with what mika is saying do you feel that as Mika is saying, once you're in the business, it's hard to go back and really get the education that you might might want to have. Is that sort of what you're saying, Mika? Yes. I mean, you still, you know, take clinics and you have a yeah. trainer or a coach, but you don't go, or it's hard to go back to like Brittany did to work for with, for somebody from scratch and learn. Um, a training system from scratch. Okay. Any comments on that, Annie or Britt? <laughs> well, I've made the extremely mature decision to never go off on my own. So <laughs> I'm always working for somebody. <laughs> are you, Annie, are you, are you working with someone? I mean, are you getting lessons? Yeah, actually, that's one thing that's been a bit harder because the place where I work, the, the other instructors are not quite at my level so and this is the first time I've ever been somewhere where I was like the best rider there I prefer to be second best because then I have more to learn you know 
exactly but but what we have is usually when there's not a pandemic we have clinics and stuff <laughs> um and what i've been trying to do recently is send videos to my favorite instructors in the u.s to get uh, updates um of advice because actually one of the horses i train is my own i have a a five-year-old hanoverian mare that's super nice and i i mean i feel like she's on the right path and everything but yeah i'm super picky so i need i need more than just being happy and b having eyes on the ground from my colleagues you know mm -hmm. so i'm doing the best i can but yeah i i'll never stop learning <laughs> Brittany, are you in a situation where you're getting instruction now? Yeah, um, thankfully I can still go back to Morton, but also one of Morton's best friends is a judge and he teaches at both of the stables that I've been at, so I can also train with him. And then there's other good people in Denmark that I'm starting to be able to go out. But transportation's hard. Um, here you have to have a separate license for a car. You can drive a horse truck, but being able to afford a car that can pull a trailer is a different ball game over here. So there's some <laughs> obstacles to being independent that we're working on, but there's a lot of good help. And also it's actually nice that everybody's going to video lessons. And then I'm two people on my list that I want to start doing that with that are actually back in the States, but they are also Morton pupils. So it's the same school of teaching that I'd like to stay in. But kind of with what Mika said, Mika and I have talked about this a lot. It's hard to go out on your own and then keep learning the way you want to. And I think I was fortunate that I didn't even actually plan to end up on my own. I had a talk with Morton when I left about whether I was ready to leave. And we both agreed I had learned enough of the system that I could stay riding that way and work for someone else. But then I tried to ride for two other people last year and I couldn't do it. We don't agree with the methods or the ethics for the horses. It just doesn't fit. So this was my way to go back to Morton's way of riding and teaching and training. And that's a little bit the flip side of once you have a system and an education, then finding where you fit can be difficult. So going on my own was my solution to that instead of, yeah, compromising my values at this point. So hopefully it works well. Yeah. So without, without getting anybody in trouble, do you have, I mean, everybody wants to go to Europe, I think, I mean, we all want to ride and train or do something in, in Europe in the horsey world. Do you have any advice, <clears throat> perhaps warnings or advice for people that might want to be doing the sort of thing that you have done? You're on the camera here. Brittany, why don't you start? Oh no. <laughs> Uh, the more I see experience it. or from what you've heard other people. I mean, just some, cause it, I was really it. freaking lucky. Yeah. So I've heard a lot more bad stories than good stories. Yeah. So my best piece of advice is to find someone, you know, whether it's me or Mika or Annie, or there's other Americans over here, but talk to someone who's been there because everything looks super great on the surface it's the same in the States. It's no different. You're just very far away from home when you're here, but it can look very much one way and it's not that way once you get there. So yeah, talk to somebody that's been there. I mean, Catherine Haddad also has offered to help girls get jobs over here and she has a big network or yeah, but go with somebody, you know, that can tell you, yes, go there. Don't go there or try it for a few weeks first if they'll take you. But finding a good place, I think is hard in any country, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, any advice? Because your your some of your situations weren't the best, as I remember. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so Brittany's advice is really, really good one. A really, really good one. Um, and I think what I would just add to that is to be true to yourself and to stick with what you believe in. Like if someone is telling you to do something that you don't think is ethical for the horse, then don't do it. Even if you work for them, like you have to keep your standard because there will be a lot of people and it might even surprise you that try to take advantage of you or try to make you do something that they wouldn't do or whatever. And um, 
you have to in your mind no matter what situation you're going into know what what you can do and what you can't do and that goes also for for riding certain types of horses like if someone tells you to get on a horse and you know it's not safe like you just say i'm not going to ride that horse sorry um but i think in your mind you have to already have those decisions kind of in order that you are not able to be taken advantage of because like uh, like she said there's actually some bad situations you can find yourself in and um yeah you have to just stay true to yourself i think mika anything to add um well just that i think like annie said um that you have to keep in mind or have a very clear idea of the kind of rider you want to become because there are a lot of good riders and or very competent trainers in Europe or in America. And it's just a matter of what style and what really what kind of writer you want to become. So that's who you want to go work for. Um, can we go back to Addie? Ooh. Brittany, we have <laughs> bonus Addie. The other three are a little older than you. How old are you, Addie? I turned 19 on Sunday. Oh, happy birthday. Um, so what what brought you to Europe? What Was this a plan ahead of time? <laughs> or did it happen? I definitely did not have a plan to come over here. So two summers ago, I had gotten like a message from Brittany, basically being like, oh, do you want to come try be at Morton's? So I went there for three months. And then was that in the summer? Yep, just for the summer. Uh-huh. Um, and then I came home. And then the next summer, Brittany texted me again and said, Hey, you should come back to Denmark. And I said, Oh, okay. So I packed <laughs> up and I came over for the summer again. And I ended up at a sales barn that um didn't really work for Brittany. So <laughs> I was by myself, but it was okay. And then, yeah, right before Corona started, Brittany texted me again <laughs> and said, I have way too many horses. Nope. Do you want to come <laughs> over to Denmark? And I said, yeah, sure. So that's why I'm here. Okay. But you're planning to go home when things open up, or are you going to stay, or should I ask? I'm trying to hire her <laughs> to stay. <clears throat> um, so I worked out with... Shelly's rider is branching off and I had already planned to go work for her like come end of summer. Mm -hmm. So I was already planning on going home and had that all set before I came over here. So I can't really stay, but I think that makes me sad. It makes me very sad, <laughs> yes. And Addie, what's the biggest thing you've seen different in the horse world there than at, at uh, in the States? Um, I think like just the level of training in general standard is so much higher like 15 year olds that can go out and like make their own grand prix horse it's crazy <clears throat> and i don't think you see so much of that in the states but well for example we have a ride test on saturday and we have i think 12 12 rides yeah. And other than I have a four-year-old doing FEI four-year-old, a six-year-old doing FEI six-year-olds, but then the lowest is like a third level out of 12 riders in our barn. Like there's nobody that's riding second level or below unless it's legitimately a young horse. And I think that's much more difficult to find in a half public riding stable at home than it is over here. A lot of the amateurs, I, pretty much every horse you see over here, like Mika said, has a flying change if it's above the age of five. Mm -hmm. owned by an amateur we have some questions coming <laughs> from the people listening to you and and one of them i think um did you learn new languages there or before you went now mika <laughs> how did you learn spanish <laughs> well actually <laughs> i'm from argentina for those who don't know but when i first moved here i would like talk to people in english like oh, really? I would be like, hello, how are you? Or like, bye, have a nice day. It's like, <laughs> but obviously you knew Spanish. 
Yes, I could communicate. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I remember yeah. when you first came to live with me, your your English wasn't so perfect. No, and we at Lendons, there used to be um, an answering machine. Uh, and you you shouldn't like let the phone get to the voice message because then you would have 10 voice messages. But w when I would pick up the phone, I wouldn't understand people. So, so you couldn't take messages. <laughs> so I couldn't take messages. So I would just let the phone ring. And it's like, well, <laughs> I'm not very helpful if I do pick up. So Annie, when you first went to Germany, did you know German? No. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how difficult was it? Uh, well, actually I learned just like the important things like how to order a beer <laughs> and then everyone else spoke English. Yeah. And, and now do you speak Portuguese? Actually I do, yes, but I didn't learn it before coming to Portugal either. Uh -huh. um, I learned it here, but I don't speak in such an eloquent way as I do in English, that's for sure. <laughs> and Brittany, you've had, well, Danish and German, how are you in those languages? Yes, uh, it's just Danish. No, none, neither. You don't Danish. speak any? <laughs> <laughs> I can say very basic things. We actually have a game if you can get out of the grocery store without admitting that you don't speak <laughs> Danish or not. But no, Danish is very difficult. They have, I think, three more vowels than we do in English, and it's nearly impossible to correctly pronounce them, even <laughs> after four years. Uh, but everyone speaks English, and they would actually prefer to practice their English than try to teach you Danish. So when Corona is over, I will be going to Danish classes so that eventually I can get a quality with, you know, the citizens here. But as of now, I can say very few things. I can understand a bit. Um, I'm getting closer to where I could be taught in Danish, but it's not there yet. Speak English to me. Now, are there visa situations for being over there, Brittany? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's actually difficult, and it puts you in a position where you have to be very careful, because even as it is now, I cannot technically legally own my own business. I can only be employed by someone in the EU. It doesn't have to be Danish, but it has to be European Union. And I have sat with immigration numerous times trying to figure out my rights, and I've talked with lawyers and accountants and everything else, but that's why I partnered with the partner that I did, is she has a farm and she can hold the work visa so I can stay. It's actually an athlete visa that I'm on. And as long as I have someone willing to do the paperwork, then I can have my own clients and everything else. But legally, I cannot own the business. So every year I have to go through a bunch of paperwork and uh, fingerprints and pictures and pay a lot of money to be able to stay. And that continues at least one more year, possibly four more years before I can do anything to get more like equality or rights or a real green card. So. It's not a comfortable situation to be in when you're relying on someone that you haven't known very long to be able to stay where you are. And so, Addie, are, are you just over there on a visitor situation? Yeah. <laughs> and Annie, what did you have to go through? Yeah, I had to get a visa as well. And uh, I have like a working visa because I came here working for someone and then I'm hoping to renew it this year working for somebody else. Um, and the only thing is it's really painful because it's just bureaucracy and if you can even imagine in Portugal bureaucracy is even more slow and complicated than it is in other places. Um, but I mean it's like superficial pain because eventually it gets done. You just have to like yeah wait. <laughs> And Mika, of course, uh, well, actually, yeah, you you got it easy. I have a European passport, so <laughs> I'm good to go. Lucky lady. <laughs> well, it wasn't it wasn't easy to get into the U.S. though. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, we have another question. Anybody that wants to ask questions, you can write them in the little chat area. Um, this is an interesting one, and I'll read it exactly as it is. Elaborate more on horses being treated as livestock rather than how we do as pets. Anybody want to start that? 
So is isn't... there a difference in the attitude, do you feel, in general towards the horses? Uh, yes. So mm, this isn't a good topic, but here, if horses go lame, they do not go into a field to retire. They get put down. And it, it, I don't know any nicer way to say that, but they also need horses over here. So if you break in a three-year-old that isn't talented enough or has a problem, it might get eaten. And that's literally the reality of it. I had a breeder bring me a horse this year that cribs. And she said, okay, if the cribbing's too much of a problem when it moves to your stable, then I put it down. And I was like, okay, this is a good horse. The half brother is freaking phenomenal. But that's her, her reality is it's not worth keeping if there's even that small of a problem. And you just have to learn, you don't take it personally. It's, it's how they make a living. Or for some of them, it's what they put all of their extra money into as a hobby, but then they don't have money for anything else. So you can't take it as personally as we do in the US. The animals don't have quite as many rights as we give them in the States. Annie, anything to add? Yeah, well, you have to, first of all, just to put two and two together. We're saying that every horse here that's more than six has a flying change. That's because how many horses don't make it to six, right? And nobody would have like a, a cute little Appaloosa that they're just having fun on, you know what I mean? So it's a bit that. Um, in Portugal, I mean, I feel like there's a little bit of a a weird uh, feeling about horses sometimes because um, like I'm really really like a big hearted horse lover like horses are pets for sure for me but the people here are so opposite not all of them but sometimes they're so far removed that it's like I can't understand they don't even realize that if you treat the horse a bit nicer he'll do something for you like, and if you treat him the way you're treating him, of course, he's going to be miserable and not work for you. Like, they're kicking themselves in the, uh, there's an expression for this, and I forgot it, but yeah. <laughs> they're making their own life harder by just being so ignorant to the nature of horses, you know what I mean? And that is something I really can't stand to see. And like I said, it it makes me just, like... <laughs> not stay for to watch because my heart is too big for the horse. And I'm just lucky now that the people I work for actually are not Portuguese. Almost no one in the barn is Portuguese. Uh, just the grooms are Portuguese. And um, I mean, the people, these are people from all over Europe and they're much, much nicer to the horses than the places I was before. And, but like, but it was something like, oh, this horse is a little lame. Let's just give him some, some basically banamine so we can keep working him. And I'm like, don't you understand? He's gonna be more lame next week. <laughs> like, that's what I mean. Like they didn't understand the nature of the horse and it made their life harder. And of course for the horses, it wasn't ethical. So that was something that was very hard to watch. Mika, do you have anything to add? Yes, I agree a little bit with um, uh, both of them that it's, just the treatment towards horses is not very cuddly and you don't see a lot of people hugging their horses or giving them kisses and that kind of stuff or turnout and our hand graze. I mean, there's not much grass here, but I'm like, I found grass within five minutes to do hand grazing when I came. And here, that's just not something that people do. I mean, they don't mistreat the horses or I haven't seen that, but it's, they're not really affect, affectionate towards them. Mm -hmm. So I, I bring the happy horse into the picture. <laughs> uh, we have another question. Obviously, and I'm reading it exactly, obviously there are lots of advantages to the horses being taught more sooner. As you said, Mika, you don't find 12 year olds without changes, but are there issues or challenges with that as well? Horses being taught too much too fast. We'll start with you, Mika. Um, well, I'm sure there would be down the road. Um, the horses that I have ridden here, um, I, I don't find that there's a big hole in their training. 
I mean, yes, I think that you could spend more time doing really clean transitions or really, um, you know, developing the connection so that everything is a little bit more refined. But I haven't seen a lot of holes necessarily that then would take you like three years to get a horse back, you know. Um, but I'm sure there is. Uh, and I'm sure if you play with things too early or too much too soon, I'm sure there, and you don't know where you're going with it, I'm sure you'll find a problem rather soon. Um, so, and I think it could also be, you know, for the horse's health, not, um, not the right thing to do, you know, then they break pretty quickly. Annie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, actually, uh, cause, um, some of the quality of training around where I am now is actually, there are people that maybe went to the Olympics, but the quality is not very good. And I've actually uh, retrained in the last couple months, several horses that were kind of ruined by uh, local people. And I think uh, it's a little bit like, I kind of alluded to it earlier that Elusitano, unfortunately, is an extremely, extremely, extremely generous horse. And if you ask right or you ask wrong, he really wants to do it for you. And I think uh, some people who only train Lusitanos feel that they like deserve that from every horse. And they, they get a little bit frustrated if a horse isn't that generous to them. But because the emotion is frustration, they, they don't... Uh, necessarily teach it more in a better way faster but they can actually kind of traumatize a, a horse especially not a lusitano although sometimes also a lusitano and so uh the main thing that i see as a lack of understanding about is um like relaxation and and suppleness and re keeping that idea in mind no matter what they're doing because some people don't know about it at all unfortunately yeah. Brittany, anything to add? Yeah, I think it matters a lot. First off, the conditioning program you have for the horses. If you really take care of the whole body as you educate them quickly, I think you can be okay. If you forget cross training, I think you can destroy their legs quite quickly. Brittany, let me interrupt because it, it, for me at least, it came through a little fuzzy. You said oh. if you forget cross training correctly. Yeah. No cross training yeah. what do you mean by that um for me it's yeah cavalettis or work outside the ring something else other than just ring work um that does more for the back that gives different terrain that you can stress not stress the tendons but exercise them in a different way that keeps the elasticity you're not just going collected extended then you can keep the horse physically okay as they're learning um, Morton has a special talent of mentally teaching a horse things very, very quickly. I mean, nearly everything in his stable can be off by four. Um, he, but the way he does it is so low stress on the body and on the mind that I haven't seen any bad effects from it. I think done most other ways that young, it could do a lot of damage. So I think it matters a lot how you take care of the horses, both mentally and physically. So it's, it's kind of like a scalpel. In a surgeon's hand, it's a tool, and in someone else's, it's more of a butcher than anything else. So you have to be a little careful. We have two questions. I love this, and they're a little bit in the same direction. Given the differences in the way horses are treated, do you feel we are less respected in the US because we cuddle? What are the views of the American horse community from your countries? Who wants to start on that one? <laughs> Not I. Uh, <laughs> You're on the screen. <laughs> well, I think, I think they do. I'm going to pretend I'm an American. But they do look at us a little bit like, you know, it, how do you say it? Um, they don't take us as seriously, for sure. And, and I don't know if it's because of that or not, but um, I don't think there's anything wrong with showing affection to your horse. 
and <laughs> they are not livestock to to me. Um, but I think it, it's all you know in, here in Spain and the macho culture. It's very much like they do. Um, they do see a little bit the Americans as like we're just like a little Fruit Loop, you know. <laughs> Annie, do you see that? Yeah, for sure. And then there's also like a bit of a stereotype, like especially when I was in Germany, that like, oh, you'll never ride. You're American. I'm like, cool. I'm here to learn how to ride. Yeah, but you're American. Like, it was a bit insulting. Uh, <laughs> and like, some I'm sure you weren't insulted at, at uh, Morton's, but what do you think? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I hope he doesn't get back to Morton. But the worst uh, insult I ever got from him was that I was riding like an American housewife. <laughs> <laughs> One day he was very displeased with something I did. I don't remember what anymore. But um, being out and trying horses, um, I got a lot of respect because I came from Morton's. But if I didn't have that name behind me, I think I could have been treated a little less respectfully because I was American. And also going through a vet check with a horse that you're trying to buy. Everyone knows that if it's being vetted by an American, they're gonna have to do 57 more things that no European would ever ask them to do before the horse can pass. So even me, I'm buying a two-year-old, and my own vet told the person I'm buying it from, oh, she's American, she won't like that. And it's like, okay, you've been treating horses for four years now, you should know me better, but I'm still an American. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, you'll always face a little bit of stereotypes, I think, no matter no matter what, but most of them are quite okay. So. Um, Brittany, you're into the buying and selling business. Do you have a couple piece of, pieces of advice for someone coming to Europe to buy a horse? Don't tell them you're American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't tell them you're American. Yeah, no, call me. <laughs> I will help you in whatever country you're in with who you should go to. Oh, there's so many dirty tricks. And everybody, Okay, everybody over here knows who does them, but some of it's disappointing who does them. Uh, yeah, <sighs> find someone you trust to work as an agent because you trying to go around by yourself is not a good idea. You'll get taken advantage of. And I also recently experienced actually a group of Americans that came over to Denmark and they called everyone and set up their own trip. And I had a very good breeder that I was riding for that as soon as he heard all of the other places they had independently called, he wouldn't show his horses. And I think I had, yeah, some of the nicest horses they would have seen on that trip. But these people, they care about their horses. Yes, they're livestock, but they take decades of selecting bloodlines and raising these horses and they care. So as soon as they found out that these people were going everywhere, they didn't think their horses would be cared about enough as like the pride of their program so they didn't even want to show them and that's something for me I think you have to come in very respectful of that this is these people's life work and some of them it's also their grandfathers were breeding so it's three four generations of people and then 12 generations of horses that you're looking at so it's more than just one horse that you want to buy one time so you need to come in a little bit humble and with someone that understands the culture of that country to say, okay, this is a good person. This horse was raised a good way, trained a good way. And then I think you can find really good horses. You can also find just dealers where it's some horse someone pulled out of somewhere that's maybe half lame, maybe drugged, maybe not safe, but that's horses everywhere. But I, again, just find someone you trust to go through or yeah yeah or good luck <laughs> <laughs> Annie or Mika do you have anything to add about buying horses over there mm -hmm. I know you well the mare I bought it, it was a really bad experience just because of the agent and the owner trying to screw me over and I was like 
sorry, I'm a professional. Like, don't you, do you think I'm actually going to go along with this? Um, but they tried. So that was a bit painful, but yeah, it's like she said, you have to just be really careful and uh, look out for those things. And the best thing to do would be to have the best agent who uh, can kind of guide you through. Mika, do you have anything to add? You know, I agree. Just like finding the good trainer here is finding a good agent to find a horse for you. Um, we have Marin's asking, are horses turned out where you train? Mika, you mentioned there's hardly any grass. Um, what about turnout? Yeah, there's not much uh, grass, but um, we have turnout. And, but there are a lot of places that don't turn out. They do use the walker a lot. Most barns have a walker and the horses go on the walker every day. But even before I came, they didn't really have a structural turnout system. So I was like, we're, we're gonna fix that. <laughs> every horse gets turned out every day <laughs> in each paddock. Um, but it's not a priority for them, I don't think. If it's raining, they don't go out. If it's Christmas, they don't go out. If it's a little out of the way, they don't go out. <laughs> so. Annie, what's your experience? Yeah, it's the same as what Mika said, uh, but most barns. Some don't even have paddocks and the ones I was at before. I mean, a problem also is they have a lot of stallions. Most of the horses are stallions. So, I mean, it's really hard to safely turn out a bunch of stallions. Um, but the place I'm at now has turned out for all the horses and they go out at least half a day. So Great. that's nice. And uh, Brittany? We're spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> Especially now we have very nice, very big grass paddocks for each horse, uh, but that's not normal. I think Denmark is better than Germany. There's not many that have good turnout in Germany. It seems more the trend here that people are starting to put the horses out more. Um, but it really depends on the barn and the space and how many horses, also the stallions. But I would think overall Denmark is a bit better than some of the other European countries that they can get out a bit more. So that's um, we'll stay with you, Britt. Um, how do boarding and training costs in your countries differ from those in the US? Uh, yeah, it's way, way, way cheaper here. Um, you can go with any, yeah, even the best trainers in Denmark, I don't think take more than about $2,000 for full training horse. And those are the very, very best people. And then it can go down to less than $1,000 for full training. And that's riding, yeah, five days a week and turnout every day and absolutely everything. So it's much, much more affordable, but you can feed a horse for, yeah, maybe what it costs to feed one or two months in the U.S. You can feed a horse for a whole year here. So it's much easier, especially for the young horses, to raise them that you can sell them for a reasonable price because the investment you're putting in and just feeding them is nearly nothing here. So that was a huge change for me looking at just what it costs to keep a horse. Annie? Yeah, it's, it's much cheaper here and Right now, the barn that I'm at, it's at like the most busy place in Portugal. So it's like the most expensive one and it still is not that expensive. Um, and you can go riding with Olympians for about 1100 per month for full training. Um, not that the quality is super high, but they are Olympians. And then, uh, yeah, but if you go to the countryside, I mean, it can cost you like a hundred bucks. It's really ridiculous, but it's just because, as you said, the feed is is not very expensive, and there's a lot of space, especially in the inland. So, Mika, here is also really, really cheap um, for board and training. Um, it's not more than fifteen hundred dollars for everything, and farrier is super cheap, and vet is super cheap like ridiculously cheap i mean as an example a children treatment in the u.s it's a thousand dollars here is i think 50. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like what children for everybody <laughs> so. 
<laughs> but it's also the salaries is are much lower and the cost of living is much lower so everything is you know goes kind of hand in hand okay our last last question um mika what are your aspirations what are you hoping is going to happen in the next year and 10 years well <laughs> first of all that you can you can we all want to get out of uh, quarantine but uh, beyond that um well for me it's the olympics um that's my biggest dream and i think being an argentinian i have somewhat of an advantage but not really but that's been my dream um if it doesn't happen well i hope that at least i can become an olympic quality rider any I'm gonna say same. <laughs> I feel like if you hang all your hopes on the Olympics and you're not in the right place at the right time, of course you would be disappointed. So meanwhile, I'm just happy to enjoy every horse I meet and hopefully make the best of everything that uh, I feel like I have also an international quality in my riding and in my training. Is this new horse, this five-year-old that you have, is you, are you hoping that's gonna be a, a really good international mm -hmm. horse? I hope so, yeah. Oh, cool. I'll send you a video. Good, mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. And Brittany? If nothing has changed since WIT, of course it's still the dream to represent your country. If it's the Olympics or Nations Cup or whatever, that's always a goal, but for me, it's not my only goal. If I can educate horses from, I still break them in myself up through the Grand Prix over and over again successfully and make good riding horses for other people, I think I'm happy with that. But of course I would like to do bigger things too. But. Fantastic. So I think any, any of you three have anything you wanna add? Any little piece of advice you might wanna give to a 12 year old out there? Mm -hmm. Uh, Annie? <laughs> I think to stay with my same thoughts, believe in yourself and do what you, what you love and trust yourself when you're in, uh, up, if you find an opportunity that uh, you can make a choice and even if it seems a bit risky, it can be the right one if you, if you like believe in what you think. <laughs> Mika, you made a big choice when you were 15 or 16 just tell them a little bit how you got to the u.s <clears throat> i came first the first time to the u.s to compete at london show when i was 13 in 2000 <laughs> so long ago <laughs> and i after i watched courtney king ride i decided i wanted to come back and become a working student so from age 14 till 17, I um, uh, saved money. And I then when I was in my school break in high school, I came to London for three months as a trial, uh, as a working student. And then I went back home, I finished high school, and I eventually came back and never left the US. Yeah, I mean, you, you basically moved to the US with out much financial backing and worked your way up from there. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm, at that point, my parents couldn't really help me. And it was really saving like 10 cents at a time when I was in Argentina and, and not riding the bus, but instead riding my bicycle to go places. And at that point, it was very clear to me that I wanted to be in the US, so I made it happen. But when I was 12, I was just doing pony games and having fun doing other things. So don't get too serious too early, I would say. Good <laughs> advice, good advice. <laughs> Brittany, do you have anything to add? What would you say to a 12 year old or what would you say to your 12 year old self, perhaps, whichever? Uh, so when I was in high school, I focused 
a lot on school. I think that that's good and I'm not telling anyone <laughs> not to do that. I took, I got into medical school at one point and clearly I didn't go, but my goal was always to have the best grades and take all the hardest classes. And if I could do it all over again, I would take more language classes. I would learn even more Spanish and German because that's what you could do in my high school. And then I would take business classes because I think that would have given me skills that I actually would use. I mean, biology, I think you should take, and anatomy, Addie and I talked about this the other day. But I think if you can look, if you really want to do horses, it's not going to be a normal path no matter what. And a lot of people won't understand that you're not just going to go to college. But do things that give you a leg up on life skills that you know about investing and saving and finances and that you're cultured enough to have a conversation with people a little bit about their country. Maybe I would have taken European history instead of just American history. Because then you can, anywhere you go, have conversations with things that, yeah, matter to the people in that country, not just your own. So I think that's what I would tell myself is it's okay not to be the best in academics. Maybe do things that would be a little more useful <laughs> in the long run. <laughs> My mom didn't like that. I told her that and she's like, you can't tell them that. I was like, it's true. <laughs> well, thank you all very, very much. And I just have one thing. We have a note here from Paz FM, I don't know who that is, but the note is, I would like to greet and congratulate Mika. I am from Argentina too, and living in the US from six months ago in Lincoln, Nebraska. So they say a special oh. hi to you, Mika. Uh, thank you, gracias. <laughs> thank you girls very oh, much. I think this has been fantastic. Yes, everybody, we give you all a big hand and oh. best of luck to you. We can't wait to hear what your where your journey takes you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good night. Oh, you all know that it's now midnight for them, so yeah. it's time <laughs> for you guys to go to bed. Don't yeah. worry, we don't start until nine. <laughs> we start at seven. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks, London. Thank you, you London. Thank you. That was great.